Malachi chapter 2, verse 10, we're looking at the priests and Judah, the sins thereof. And it said, God is writing, or speaking, Malachi is writing, and God brings up what they said. It's almost like taking Judah and the priest to court. And it's not hearsay, it's actual testimony. Verse 10, chapter 2. Have we not all one father? And we've already read earlier, it's, you know, a, fa a son honors his father. If I be your father, where's my honor? But we're going to look at another avenue here. Has not one God created us? So, I don't, I'm thinking today, I, I don't know if you would say abomination. But, the word of God for the Jew even today is the, the five books of Moses. And the five books of Moses brings out very first chapter, creation. Now, I don't know how far the Jews have gotten today, and they're celebrating Gay Pride Month and all that. Jeremiah says they got the Queen of Heaven. Their I mean, they've gone sour. They're going bad. I don't know if you would call it an abomination or extreme sin. It would be detestable for a Jewish person today, or any Jewish person, to acknowledge, teach, and honor evolution. Where the book of Moses and the prophets, as we're reading the prophets now, states to the fact is God created. Nowhere in the, in the Bible does the Bible back any of the evolutionary teachings or Darwinism. So why do we deal treacherously? We have uh, betrayed the trust. Every man his neighbor, his brother, excuse me. What God writes, and what God speaks in Malachi writes is the Jew and the priest, sadly to say, has come to a state of, I can't trust you. Whether it be lies, deception, whatever goes on. You say, how so is it? God says, it's action, it's happening. I have dealt with so many preachers. And I said, they're the preacher stories. And yet they apply them to their own life. That's a lie. Everybody lies, but, you know, just to get someone applause and get, you know, gratification. Well, what else would you do to gain the people's favor and look at the lies of the senior church age? And they have broken the trust of his brother, Jew, by profaning the covenant of our fathers. And that father's runs back to, all the way back to Abraham. And there were covenants that God settled with the Jew. One of the covenants would probably be is they're not circumcising their, their, their sons. That was a covenant. They're definitely not honoring the law. Judah has dwelt treacherously. They, they, they violated the trust. 
and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Okay, now we're looking at an abomination. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved. Now, Judah is not the priest. So now we're stepping away from the priest, and now we're talking actual another tribe of Israel, Judah, which is made up of Benjamin and Simeon. Because there's Israel north. And according to God, both nations of Israel, divided, are doing this. What is the abomination? has married the daughter of a strange God. Well, even the Apostle Paul tells us in Corinthians, we are not to be unevenly yoked with unbelievers. He tells a widow, hey, get married. Only in the Lord. A Christian, not, not anybody else, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about a Christian has no business marrying a Catholic, Jehovah Witness, Muslim, Mormon, Seventh day, no business at all. But we are looking at the covenant of the fathers, the law. The law prescribes the Jew is Judah is to marry. A family in Judah. Levi is to marry a family of Levi. Simeon is to marry a family of Simeon. Benjamin is to marry. Yeah, I mean, you want to talk about you know, prejudice and you want to talk about you know marriage and stepping outside the bonds and all that. We're going to see God's going to make a very bold statement about Israel. Isaac and Rebekah told Jacob, go to, uh, to Rebekah's family and find a wife of Rebekah's family to keep the race pure. Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were forbidden to marry outside of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then later outside their particular tribe. And people say, well, is it okay? <laughs> there are boundaries. I mean, you got white, you got black, and you got brown people. Isn't that enough to say that, that there is a bound? <laughs> of course, in this day and age, this blinded day and age, and this, and this perverse day and age, what they're teaching, what they're not teaching, and all that, you know, prejudice them. I can't imagine today in a public school system someone trying to put a puzzle together because if they're offended at the peace and all that. If God set forth his people within tribe, within Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the fact is that Esau, Edom, went to Ishmael, a, door, a family of Abraham, and that grieved Isaac and Rebekah. Ishmael went into Moab, which is the family of Abraham, through Lot. Esau is your cultural unity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He married a whole family. And they're all against one people, the Jews. Now, is there a strict thing that a white is to marry a white, and a, a black is to marry a black, and a brown is to marry a brown, and a German is to marry a German, and all that? Well, you can't honestly say anything like that today because you'd be called prejudiced. 
Listen, when I grew up as a little boy, uh, I'm 54 years old right now. I remember in the city of New London, I remember there was, two, there was an Italian section, there was a Polish section, there was a Puerto Rican section, there was a colored section. There were different sections in New London. And let me tell you, there was only one race of people that were crossing. Two races of people. The African and the Puerto Rican were the ones that were, everybody else stayed in their own area. There was a small Polish section in New London, Connecticut, and I can show you a map. And they had their own Catholic church. And that Catholic church spoke Polish. I know that. My family came over through Ellis Island, Polish Roman Catholic. And I'm going to stick my neck out and say, hey, yeah, white is white, black is black, brown is brown. Listen, listen, Aaron and Miriam got upset because Moses married an Egyptian. We are in a perverse, jaded generation today of what is ever being taught to be taught. It's wrong. So they had proclaimed the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, married a daughter, not only uh, outside of race, daughter of a strange God. Now, at least the assumption is that's a Gentile. But Jeremiah tells us they had a strange God. They had the, the queen of heaven. God doesn't tell us that that daughter was Jewish or it didn't bother. She, the ultimate sin is she is a daughter of Esther, Tammuz, Eros, the Pope, the American Idol, the Queen of Heaven. The millions of trillions of gods of India. The, 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 I don't know what you call them, but the UFOs that you become in the Mormon church. You got to populate outer space planets. Zeus. And you can go to a store or you can go online, you can type... <laughs> It, it, just narrow it down, Roman mythology gods. And true, this, this, I studied that stuff. I had a book of uh, it was the size of a dictionary, Roman and Greek. Not Babylonian, Roman and Greek. Gods. You realize on, on, the, on the Catholic calendar that we have, 365 days, there are 365 saint days. There's Saint Mary, there's Saint Guadalupe, there's Saint Joseph, there's Saint George, and Saint Thomas, and Saint... There are names that you know you never even heard in the Bible. Every day there's a saint day. That's a God. And I'm going to assume again that this strange God is a Canaanite God. Because those Canaanite gods kept coming in there because when Joshua failed, and didn't drive out all the nations, the gods stayed. And you had a problem with Dagon. You had a problem with Baal. And you had a problem with Esther. And look what, look, look what God says. You profane the holiness of the Lord, it's an abomination. You married a daughter of a strange God. So, you're saved. You're a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. And you come home and tell mom and dad, I met this girl. Oh, tell us, well, you know, she's Catholic. She got the Pope. 
she's got Mary. Or any other reason. She's in a wicked. She's got witchcraft in the hunt. God says that's an abomination. God says that, that's profane holiness. Paul said no. You can run to Pauline epistles and quote from Paul. The Lord will cut off, and I told you over and over and over and over in Israel, that cut off is you died and you went to hell. The Lord will cut off the man that do it. You marry a woman who's not Jehovah, not the Lord, not the I Am. God says about that man, I'll cut him off. And read your Old Testament. They're in there. Look at the trouble Samson had. The master, that's rabbi. Remember all the times they, they come up to Jesus, master? Master? That's rabbi. That's a teacher. And the scholar, that's somebody who's educated. The educator and and the master, the rabbi and the scholar, those who are to know what the law says, and they commit an abomination and, and defile the holiness of God by going against what the scriptures say, the Old Testament law and prophets. And they married a woman of a strange God. And there are probably preachers out there that have done the same thing. Out of the tabernacles of Jacob, there are these masters, these rabbis, these scholars. They are of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, when he says Jacob, you definitely can't go Ishmael. And him that offereth now put this down for your Baptist teaching when we come up to you know the, 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 the storehouses of heaven. Okay, ready? Him that offereth, that's somebody that brings a lamb, a goat, a turtle dove, wheat, barley, oil, okay? Him that offers an offer unto the Lord of hope. He comes to the temple and he brings his offering prescribed by the law or brings a offering. And his wife is a wife of a strange God and we read about that in Jeremiah where the wives are baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven. And the children are involved in the Queen of Heaven worship and thus the husband guy will get the wood. Pretty much many families the wife rules the roof. I don't care the husband, the king of the castle, and all that. I'm not going to get into it. I thank God that God gave me a God, had given me a, a godly wife, and I had a second wife. And <laughs> a wife upset can ruin the family. A happy wife is a happy no 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 no. A happy wife may be an unhappy husband. Okay. Do you see the rabbi, the scholar, and the man that brings the ark? They've sinned against God with a strange God, marrying a woman up. 
This have ye done again. What, what do you mean again? This happened during Jeremiah. Before you went into captivity. And now you're out of captivity. And you're doing it again. So when you look at church history, when you look at the seven churches, you say, well, why is this church, <coughs> excuse me, why did this church do the sins of that church? Because man never learns, and history repeats itself. How on earth this church get so bad with churches like, because we're not in an evolutionary process, we don't get better. We get worse. Now, you see, I don't read the Old Testament. Then how can you explain done again if you didn't read Jeremiah? And it's those women with the Queen of Heaven. You know why we studied that out? Because here we are again. Now, is it the Queen of Heaven? I don't know. Probably, uh, is it? Uh, he does not say who it is. So look, look at this. Now I want you to mark this down. Okay? I want you to see how the church puts you in the Old Testament. Oh, this was such a great message. All eyes closed. All heads bow. All eyes closed. And anybody wants to come up the altar and cry and look at things right with God. You show me where that is in the New Testament. Okay? We got people up here that put their ball in their eyes out. <laughs> Watch this. Covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and crying out. Friend, that's Old Testament. And that's not the altar where you got a couple steps that go up to the platform. That's the brazen altar. And friend, don't put your arm and don't put your hand on that brazen altar. You're going to burn yourself. And the preachers will tell you, and the pastors will say, well, yeah, we, we know that there's no altar in, 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 in the Bible for the, for the church and all that. Uh, yeah, but you must be putting us back under another altar. And then you turn around and say, well, we're not under the law. We're under grace. Lord, I want to thank you for being this assembly of this place right here, this one great church that we are. It sounds like you're trying to put us back under the law. An altar where people are in tears and weeping and crying out. This is Malachi. You know why I say it's important? Because we're going to come to another chapter in Malachi where a preacher will get up and preach about you giving tithes to the church. Now let me tell you, as of where we studied right now, we got two more chapters of Malachi. I want you to tell me where we read right now. And when we come to the, before Malachi chapter 4 or in chapter four, before we close the Malachi, I want you to stop me when we talk about the suffering, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. By we close in Malachi chapter 4. I want you to say, stop! There it is. There's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying somebody get right, somebody we've been crying boo-hooing to God. But don't put us under that altar with the impression, oh, we're not under the law. And then a couple more chapters go in there and preach the message of the law about tithing. The weeping, the tears, and the crying right now. You know what it is about? I married a woman who's got a strange God and my family's a wreck. God, do you know what that rabbi showed me in, your, in, in the prophets? He showed me the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah. How come I didn't see that before? 
you know where we're going with this? We're going to be taken over. We're going to be put into captivity. Our nation's going to be destroyed. This happened in Jeremiah. Oh my Jehovah. You say, does it happen? What on earth happened in 70 AD? Their tears weeping and crying out because they married the wrong woman. Insomuch that he regardeth not the offerings anymore. Alright, now with Malachi, now just preach what I just told you in, in your Baptist church. Ready? Go back to verse 12. So th there's the master, there's the rabbi, there's the scholar. The tabernacles of Jacob, here, here's the Jewish person, and him that offers their offerings unto the Lord. These people, these Jewish people, these these rabbis, these scholars, these people that come to the temple with their sheep, their oil, whatever they bring, they have married women of strange gods. They are weeping. They are crying. They're, they're, they're at the altar. And God says, I regard not your offerings anymore. Preach that with your tithing. Preach that to the people who get to your church and they sin against God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and maybe Sunday afternoon, and they had no regard to God in their sinning, but they come back on, on the first day of the week, the, Lord, the Lord's Day, and they, they put their money in the plate, and then they go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, and they just go back sinning, and they don't care. And God says, I don't, you put that in there, I'm not putting it on your record. Preach that. How can, when was the last time you heard Malachi chapter 2 in your tithing? They bring an offering, verse 12, and God says, he, he, that's God, regardeth not the offering anymore. That's it, I'm done. And God's a great record keeper. You're going to get to heaven, and you're going to find out. All right, he gave... 250s in his lifetime. He gave, uh, I'm just giving up, 236 20s, 487 10s, 1,300 fives, and 8,000, eight, eight, I'm just saying dollars, 46 checks, and then, you know, you want the quarters, nickels, pennies, and dimes, and that accidental lip ball that went in there. And God say, okay, here's the offering. God's going to, I don't know what angel or anything like an angel be there. God, you want me to record that? Nope. But God, he brought the sheep. I don't care what he brought. The law stated if you sin to be forgiven, you had to sin unwillingly. And the revelation that you get that you have married the wrong woman and you and you're in trouble. You see, we don't have the license to sin. And there are some out there that think, oh, Christians have that liberty, you know, we can just sin whenever we want to. We don't. And there are some Christians that live like it. I found out my grandpa used to, and I don't know why. But my grandpa would say, my grandpa used to take me to Catholic Mass Saturday night. And I was like, I was wondering, why Saturday night? Why not Sunday morning with everybody else? But now, This is not my grandpa, but I found out Catholics have a Mass on Saturday night. So you can get all your sins under the confession and all, take the blood of Jesus, do orally and eat his body. and that, So you can sleep in on Sunday morning. You don't need to set the clock or ring the bell to come to church. Isn't that convenient by the church? But still come and put your money in the plate. Just do it Saturday evening. Or receive it with good will at your hand. God's got to the point, you know what? You are living in open sin. I'm not going to take it. 
Now we're going to go to a couple chapters, Lord willing, and we're going to talk about giving tithes and all that. So, I know people in church, they know alcohol's wrong. And they work for an alcohol distributing company. That's their paycheck. And they, if they tithe their paycheck, and they put it in that plate, is not alcohol wrong? Why is the marker strong drink is deceiving thereby whosoever, whosoever deceived thereby is, is unwise, I think. So when you get a Christian who knows alcohol is wrong, oh, I don't drink it, I just sell it. I just give it to the stores to sell it. Here's the money that the alcohol company's given me, and I put it in a plate. What do you think God does with that? Do you think God honors that? You say, what do you think, Sally? I, I don't know. That's a thin line. I would hate to end up getting ahead and say, Lord, look at all the money I gave you. You didn't give me nothing. Well, why not? Look at the job you have. You think God honestly would honor somebody who sells illegal drugs on the street, walk in the church, put the money in the plate? You think God's going to honor that? You think God would honor a woman that sells her body? For prostitution, you think God's going to give her? He said, why did you say something like that? Because I was in a church one time. And I was asked for my family and I to bring this woman home. And the pastor told me when I was a lady, she's a prostitute. Excuse me, friend, what's she doing in church? Oh, no, we can't say that. we got to be proper and all that. So what we do is we have to excuse their sin so we need to be proper. Is that what you're telling me? And they'll say it other ways. Uh, you know, what if a woman came into the church bikini all that? All right, she's unsaved. She don't know any better. But what if she's saved? And look at the mess of the churches. All are welcome. Yet ye say, Wherefore? Come on, God, why? Because the Lord has been a witness between thee and the wife of thy youth. Uh oh. You've been married for a while. Against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. You have been betraying your trust to your wife. Now, we, we switch the coin. We're not talking about that woman that's married to a strange God. You see the switch we just had? You cause your wife, priest, cause your wife to betray your trust. You are more faithful to something or someone else, the ministry, whatever it is, then your wife. Against whom thou hast done treacherously, that's, again, that, that's betraying the trust, yet she is thy companion, and lead into the, well, she's not your companion, and the wife of thy covenant, you made a vow to that woman. She is part of you. Going all the way back to Adam and Eve. And you're a great rabbi. You're a great scholar. You're a great person in, in the assembly of Israel. And your own wife doesn't have trust in you.
Now watch, watch Moses. Did not he make one? That goes all the way back to Genesis. Adam said, this is bone of bone in my flesh, and I'm not going for it. She shall be one. We shall be one. One and one. Two shall be one. Now, a Jew is going to recognize that from Genesis. The scholar is going to recognize that from Genesis. <coughs> Excuse me. The rabbi is going to recognize that from Genesis. But you have caused some kind of, whatever it is, Yet, had he the residue of the Spirit, wherefore one? That he, may, that he might seek a godly seed. Talking about Israel. And all the laws prescribing the, 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 the marriage. You can only marry within one tribe. That is that God wants a pure race of people. And it's kind of funny because when you look at the genealogy of Jesus, it's anything but godly. And Lord willing, we're going to be talking about that in a month. When we get to the genealogy of Jesus, both Matthew and Luke, we got some characters in there. <laughs> but that's man. That's where they failed the law. That's why Jesus had to come. The very genealogy of Jesus shows you, oh man. You realize if Jesus didn't come, the very genealogy that would have been of Jesus, he came. But let's say he did come. The very genealogy of Jesus, oh, you're going to hell. You got some prostitutes in there. You got some harlots. Man, if we sinned because of Adam, oh, go back and take Trace your family tree, my man. God wanted the Jew, that pure, thoroughbred race of people. Which they're not. They failed. God wanted, hey, you of Judah, you be Judah all the way back to Judah, Isaac, Abraham. You Levi, you be Levi all the way back to Israel, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> Excuse me. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. That's that's not the Holy Spirit. That's your spirit inside of man. Let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. You better treat that woman faithfully. Your marriage better be faithful. You better not even lead her to think that you're unfaithful. There are men, they're great men in the ministry and all that, but their marriage lives suck. There are great men in the pulpit, there are great men throughout church history, and their fatherhood of their parents sucked. Look at Samuel. Man, that guy had a circuit, that guy anointed king, but his children. Billy Sunday was a great man. Uh, man, he had he had alcohol company. They, they, they put him, they, they wanted him dead. They hired people to go kill Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday would shut theaters down. Billy Sunday would shut bars down. Billy Sunday would preach. They would take a bar, close the bar out, clear out the bar, open it up to be a church. Billy Sunday didn't go to a regular church. Billy wasn't. Billy Sunday wasn't a part of a member of church and his children. You can go read. Died tragically. And when you look at the elder and you look at it written, Paul writes to Timothy and Paul writes to, to Titus, you have to be faithful to that wife and you have to be faithful to your children. When I look at a church and there's a pastor, I look at your children first. 
There's one church we were in, and I don't even know who the children were, and it had nothing to do with the ministry no more. Anything to do with the ministry. Ah, this place ain't going far. For the Lord, the God of Israel, there's the whole focus of Malachi. Will you get that, please? Will you get that, Israel, with chapter 1, verse 1? As we come up to that magic chapter pretty soon about tithing and giving. Say it that he, God, hates putting away divorce. They were divorcing their wives in Malachi. For whatever reason, or no reason, I'm done with you. Goodbye. See, we stepped out of the wife being uh, of a strange God. Now we're good. <laughs> Just get out of here, will you? And the law prescribed, hey, you know, you give her a right, you know, for any unclean thing, you can get rid of her. That's the law. The law says that. And God gets to the point by the, by the close, the last book of, of the Old Testament, of the King James Bible, the old, the last book of the Jewish Bible is 2 Chronicles. <coughs> the loving God says, the God that don't hate anything says, I hate divorce, right there. 2.16. Now Jesus comes up and they, they, guess who questions Jesus about marriage and divorce? <laughs> the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, and the rabbis. <laughs> God says, I hate putting away, but you know what Jesus said about divorce? He said, hey, what did he say? He said, and I'm not going to quote it for faith, but he said, Adam said, where man and woman shall be one. Recognize that? Verse 15. God not intended, uh, 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 not verbatim, but God never intended man to divorce a woman, his wife, from the beginning. But, Jesus said, you said for, does he say fornication? Forget the, I think he says fornication. He says, if that woman steps out of your marriage, all right, that's grounds for a divorce. That woman says, oh, I have no husband. Jesus said, yeah, I know. And the man, you, you've got five husbands, and the one right now you're with ain't your husband. Didn't quote that for me. Apologize to God. I hate putting away, but Jesus said, listen, if your spouse, and that would be the man too, if that spouse has, has stepped outside the marriage vows, and we already saw that, in the eyes of God, that marriage is over. I'm going to tell you something. Many many don't believe this. and You're of that man in the teaching. When you step from a husband and wife marriage bed and get involved in fornication and adultery into a bed with a, a, a woman or a man that's not your spouse. God told that woman, when she said, yeah, I have no husband. He goes, yeah, I know, but you know, the one you're with is not even your husband. The moment that somebody is unfaithful to their spouse, Fornication, it means you have sex with somebody who's not your spouse. God looks at that marriage, okay, right, that marriage is done. You married to somebody else. And you don't need to stand at a pulpit, and you don't need to get a marriage license. And the problem with some ministers and some preachers and some pastors out there is, oh, I, I'm faithful one marriage. I've had one marriage ceremony with, with, with a preacher and a marriage license and all that. One marriage. And God would say, yeah, but the woman you're with right now, she, you got three or four or five or six wives. 
if we open up the closet, well, we didn't strange rings, we didn't get a marriage license. Yeah, but fornication and adultery, that considers, that broke your present marriage and you married somebody else. That's how that woman could be married to four husbands. Now, that's not a teaching in today's church because some preachers have zipper troubles. And they can look at you with their fingers crossed behind their back. They have one marriage ceremony. Uh, no, 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 no. How many women have you been with? Uh-huh. God hates putting away. For one cover his violence with his garment. And that, that's, you know what, you, 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 you've got to sin. Let's say you go out and you stab somebody with a knife, and you got blood over you, and it's like a movie. Well, what he does is he grabs something out, and he wraps himself so no one sees the blood until he gets home. He washes his hands. Like Pilate tried to do. You know, if if I put this suit on, hear what I said? If I put this suit on, I'm Mr. Innocent. Oh, man. You may have the congregation full. Listen, there, for me, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but there's a lot of skeletons in my closet. It's under the blood, but this, this <laughs> all right. The sins are washed, the sins are cleansed, but the skeletons are still there. <laughs> a lot of preachers, you know, they, they they put double locks on that door. Well, if God wanted to open that door up, save the Lord of hosts. I mean, if you murder somebody then you got saved, you're still a murderer. If you've done somebody wrong and you brought it and put it under the blood of Jesus Christ, all right, there's still reconciliation, there's still atonement you have to make. Not only did I witness to de my dad the, se the, the second day I got saved, but there was a time I sat down, I wrote my dad a letter, and I said, Dad, listen, I stole money from you. I've not been a good, faithful son to you, and at this moment right now, you name a price, and I will somehow pay it back. I want to make a real reconciliation to you. I want to apologize to you and my God. And as far as the money I stole from you, and I stole, I stole 20 you give me a mount, I am, I will not debate that mount, and I will somehow pay you off that amount. You say, what's that? And my dad told me, he says, you know, don't worry about it, son. I'm clear of God, and I'm clear of men. If a man murders somebody, then he gets saved. And he goes before a judge and says, Your Honor, I, I trusted Jesus as my Savior, and I, I murdered someone. Whatever that judge does, well, okay, now you made atonement. You made reconciliation. If you got adultery and fornication and marriage beds, and hoardings in your bedroom closet, and you're a preacher, and you're up there preaching and all that. And don't you say, "Oh, no, I got one marriage ceremony." <laughs> well, don't get up and preach about the woman's got four husbands. All heads bow, all eyes closed. You gotta raise your hand first, preacher.
Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Again, that's man. That's not the Holy Spirit. That you deal not treacherously. I have trouble saying that word. That is, you have betrayed your faith. Listen, you don't have to sleep with another woman, but if your eyeballs are looking at other women, who started looking upon a woman the lust after his heart and has already committed adultery with her. Well, of course your wife ain't going to trust you. You make fun of her. You be, you call her names and you call her. Eh, you're good for nothing. Or you think, and then you want her on years later and all that. She has she has no respect for herself. She yeah. I wonder who said that. Ye have wearied the Lord. Oh boy. With your words. Now, what of those words can be? Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm at the altar. I'm sorry. <laughs> then you get in the car and you be that same idiot that you were coming to church. You're the same idiot you are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. How about taking your spouse off, off without the children, taking it somewhere in a park, somewhere, somewhere where there's no other people that say, listen, you know what, hon, I'm an idiot. Shut up, I'm an idiot. I'm wrong, I've done you wrong. I want you right now from this day forth. I want you to help me to make it right with you. I want you to help me to do right with you. I want you to help us together to walk before God. That would not weary the Lord. Yet, yeah, here we go. Here we go, Malachi. Yet ye say, where have we wearied him? There's God quoting them. All right, now we're going to go to another subject. You ready? Boy, we covered a lot. Where have we wearied him, God? When ye say, everyone that doeth evil, you sin. You sin. You're doing wrong. Is good in the sight of the Lord. That's not your churches and religions today. What is it? All I welcome here. Well, you know, God hates to sin, loves the sinner. Now, there's nothing wrong with that star. There's nothing wrong. As long as you give a gift, to, you know, a birthday gift to Jesus. Oh, listen, listen, Pastor. Listen, that's paganism. And I don't care. We're going to still do it like that. Listen, those Bibles are wrong. All I try to do is help your people. To do that's garbage. By the way, that same man I'm talking about today wasn't in church. He's at a football game, and he took many pictures of where he sat in the in the in the where the, the good seats look like to me. He, he's at the football game instead of teaching his people. There are religions. Let me say religions. There are religions out there if you sin, if you're doing evil. Well, it's okay in sight of God. Good intentions. Put money in the pot. Go in this little room and tell that guy. And he, and he, God, is what they say, delighteth in them. What do you think people think when they go to a church in their sins and under the banner of that church all are welcome here? Well, God must love sodomites because I'm a sodomite and I'm a they treat me so well here. Or they say, where is the God of judgment? Judge not the easy be judged. God's a loving God. Judgment? Oh, God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. 
We're having a fellowship dinner at 4 o'clock. Bring your favorite dish. Bring enough for everybody. All are welcome here.